and uh, I just trust it's been a, a good time for you as you just been able to celebrate the Lord and his birth. And um, But this morning, I, I, I confess to you that I probably have had at least three messages that I've kind of worked on for this morning. Um, you know, I kind of headed one direction, and then that didn't seem to work, and then kind of headed a different direction, and that didn't seem to work. And finally, I, I wound up with a passage that uh, uh, I trust will be a challenge and a, and, a, and, a, and a blessing to you this morning. You know, I love the Gospels. I hope you enjoy reading about the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Gospels, we find out about Jesus coming to earth. Uh, he took upon himself the form of a man, lived a perfect, spotless, sinless life, and yet he died upon a cross to pay the penalty of, of your sin. That's a wonderful thing. I'm thankful not only did he die upon the cross, but he was buried and then he arose again the third day, demonstrating his power over death and his ability to offer to you power over death and eternal salvation. I trust this morning that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. If not, my burden and prayer is that before this service is even completed this morning, that you will turn to Christ and to Christ alone for eternal salvation. It's wonderful to know that your sin is forgiven. And that would be my burden, and I'm sure the burden of many that are, that are here. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And uh, he's saying there's only one way. Now, people will tell you there are many ways. In fact, some people see it kind of like a big mountain, and they think, okay, some people come up this way, and some people come up this way, and other people come up a different way. But really, the Bible says there's only one way to salvation, and that's through Christ. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says it this way, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, only through the name of Christ. And so my burden this morning is that you would trust Christ as your own personal Savior if you do not already know him. The other thing I enjoy about the Gospels is you find Jesus in the Gospels demonstrating his ability to teach truth. He's the master teacher. And one of the ways that he does that is through parables, stories. Today we're going to look at one in the Gospel of Luke, if you'd like to turn there, Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 and verses 36 and following. This particular parable is called the parable of the two debtors. Not a long parable. In fact, it's really kind of short. But there's some background to it that we need to understand. And uh, I want to begin this morning by sharing with you simply three thoughts. First of all, I want you to notice the setting of the parable. That really begins in, in verse 36 down through verse 39. Let me read it to you, and then we'll come back and kind of comment along the way. Verse 36 says this. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and then wipe, did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. This setting that is provided for us is important to understand, because if we don't understand the setting of what's happening, we're not likely going to grasp the, the principle that the, the parable teaches. It begins by talking about a man by the name of Simon. He's a, he's a Pharisee. He invites Jesus to come and dine with him. We really don't understand why. It doesn't tell us why in the passage. Sp some speculate that Simon was a little curious. He just, you know, he'd heard about Jesus. He had heard that he was a great teacher. Perhaps he had heard that he was a prophet. Perhaps what Simon was doing was just sort of checking Jesus out to make sure for himself. He wanted to know firsthand about this man called Jesus. That may have been the reason. Others speculate that maybe what he was doing was trying to disprove him. He had heard about Jesus, had heard that he was a prophet, and, 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 and he wanted to sort of uh, disprove the fact that this, this man, there was nothing to him, this Jesus man, there was nothing to him at all. He wasn't a prophet. But the passage really doesn't tell us. He simply invites him to come and dine with him. We do learn in verse 36 that he's a Pharisee, Simon the Pharisee. Now, a Pharisee in that day was a religious leader, a very devout person. 
one that uh, had kept the law uh, in a scrupulous fashion, so much so that he, he really was very proud of the fact that he had kept the law in every way possible. As he looked at himself, he would have seen himself as a righteous person, a, a guy that was sort of a cut above the average person. And he certainly would not have seen himself as a sinner. He was Simon the Pharisee. Interestingly, although he invites Jesus, he doesn't offer to him the common courtesies of the day. Typically, when you invite, would invite someone to your home, there would be certain things that you would do for him. One of the things that you would provide would be water for his feet to be washed. A basin would be provided, and one of the servants there within the home would, would kneel down before the guest, would wash the feet of the guest, but there was no water that was provided for Jesus, not at all. The other thing that would have been happened is as, as you would have entered into the home, the guest or the host would have, would have greeted the guest with a kiss, usually on each side of the cheek. And that would have been an indication of a courtesy extended to a guest that you would invite in your home. But there was no kiss for Jesus that he extended. The other thing that would have been true is, is very likely there would have been oil that would have been provided for the head. It was a very hot part of the world. It was a way of providing refreshment for your guest. But no, no oil was provided for Jesus in the household of Simon the Pharisee. Yet in spite of the discourteousness of Simon, Jesus was willing to enter into the household of Simon to be his guest that day. Interesting, in, in that day as they would come, in fact, notice it says um, in verse 36, uh, and he went into the Pharisee's household and sat down to meet. Now the word sat down really means to recline. In those days, as they would have tables and they would, they, would, they would eat together, the tables were low to the ground. You didn't really sit like we do in chairs today. They would lie down. Typically, what would happen is their feet would be stretched out behind them. They would sort of lean on one arm and hold themselves up, and that way they could partake and eat with the other, with the other hand. It would be free to eat. And so all the guests would have been around that table, those low tables, and the feet would have been stretched out behind them, and he here, Jesus, is declining or reclining there and sitting at meat with, with Simon the Pharisee. You know, it's even interesting that he would, Jesus would even go. Many guests in that day, had they not been extended the common courtesies, probably would have walked out with a sense of contempt, but not Jesus. I think one of the reasons is because he had a burden for this man, Simon. G. Campbell Morgan says it this way, Jesus loved Simon just as much as he loved that woman. In Simon's house, he sought to open Simon's eyes and, and to lead him to the light. I think one of the reasons Jesus was enter, in, willing to enter into this situation, fully knowing that Simon was sort of holding him a bay at a distance, not being very courteous to him at all, was that he was interested in, in, in allowing Simon to understand the truth about the way of salvation. In verse 37, something happens. The whole scene sort of changes. It would have been some tension that would have been there earlier. There would have been the lack of courteousness. All the people might have sensed that. But it was, it was somewhat of a calm scene until verse 37 happens where it says, And behold, that's a little word, an attention-getting word. It's sort of like, hey, listen, look. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. In those days, it was not uncommon at all. There would be guests that would be invited for a home, and people from the street, as we would think of it, could enter into that area in which they would recline. Those people would often stand at the perimeter of the room, sort of around the room, at the feet of the guests. And sometimes they would converse with the guests. Sometimes they would, they would actually get table scraps, as we would think of it, from the, from the table. It was, this was not an uncommon scene at all. But this woman entering in was something altogether different. Because, as it says, a woman in the city which was a sinner. In other words, she had a reputation. Now, we're not exactly sure what her sin was. People speculate that perhaps she was a prostitute, and maybe she was. But the passage doesn't really tell us. It simply tells us that she enters in uh, to Simon's house, where, and when she knew that Jesus was there, she entered in bringing this alabaster box of ointment. Now, just so you'll know, this was not an easy entering in for this woman. She knew that by the very fact of her reputation, to enter into Simon the Pharisee's house, 
there would have been all kinds of looks of contempt that would have been given to her. Some might even have scoffed. Some would have glared at her with anger and ridicule that she would even dare to enter into Simon's house. She knew entering into this house that there would be tensions that would be there just because she was willing to do this. We're not exactly sure all the background of this passage. Some speculate why she entered in. What she was doing is she had heard about Jesus being the prophet and she was entering in with the idea of of somehow hoping to find salvation through Christ. Others, and I think more accurately speculate, that she had already come into contact with Jesus previously. She had actually already trusted in Christ for salvation And when she heard that Jesus was in the household of Simon, she wasn't coming in to find salvation. She was coming in because she had already found salvation in Christ, and she wanted to demonstrate her gratitude unto the Lord for the forgiveness of sin that she had experienced. She was bringing this alabaster box. Now, it's not a box as we would think of it. It would be more like a container, a perfume container. Typically, they would be sealed The only way to allow the perfume to come out, which, by the way, would have been very costly. In fact, some speculate even as much as as a year's wage would have been the value of this perfume in this container, this alabaster box. But the only way to get to the the ointment inside, to the perfume inside, was to actually snap the neck uh, of the flask that held that perfume. So this was a very precious gift that she was coming in order to be able to demonstrate her love unto the Lord and appreciation for all that he had done unto her, uh, done for her. And she knew that just entering into that household, there would have been this resistance, this sense of, of, of distaste and disdain for her that she would have to face and deal with. But she was willing to come anyway. Notice it says in verse 38, and she stood at his feet, that is at Jesus' feet, behind him weeping. Now, I think if you use your imagination here, here's Jesus stretched out, he's leaning upon one arm, perhaps partaking of some of the things at her table, his feet are out behind him, and she's standing at his feet, and as she stands there, the the emotion of the moment just kind of overwhelms her. And she begins to weep. In fact, she begins to weep profusely, so much so that the tears are just flowing down her cheeks and falling upon the feet of Jesus. Probably she's a little embarrassed about that moment. And it says that, that uh, uh, she stood at his feet weep, behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears. And then she does something that was considered inappropriate in that day. She lowers her hair down to begin in public, to begin to wipe the very tears from the feet of Jesus, somewhat maybe embarrassed about all that had happened, but but there as she's there, and then she begins to kiss his feet in verse 38. And then she takes out that flask and snaps the neck of that flask and begins to pour that ointment upon the feet of Jesus, all in demonstration of the appreciation of how much Jesus means to her because of what he, what he has done for her. Can you imagine what it would have been like as being there? Everybody at the table would have been looking at what was happening. Everyone at the table would have been shocked and somewhat overwhelmed that this woman was even willing to enter into Simon's house, much less this whole scene of the tears and, her, and wiping the tears from, with her hair and the, uh, the, the ointment and, and, and the, the smell of that perfume would have, would have just gone throughout the, the room. Everyone, everyone there, you couldn't have missed this even if you had wanted to. And then notice verse 39 where it says, Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, that is he saw this taking place, he spake, don't miss these words, within himself. He wasn't talking out loud. These were his words that he was thinking. And here's what he's saying. This man, speaking of Jesus, if he were a prophet, and I think he probably would have said it more like this, this man, if he were a prophet, implying he definitely is not, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Can you hear the, kind of, the sense of disdain that he would have for her? 
and even that he would have for Jesus, that he would dare to allow this woman from the street, whatever sin that she had committed, prostitution or whatever it had been, that she would, he would allow her to even touch him. All of that provides kind of the setting for the parable. It's not a long parable. In fact, if, if you look beginning really in verse 40, what happens is he begins to, to tell the parable. The details of the parable. Notice the details of the parable. Verse 40 says this, And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There's this teachable moment that he wants Simon to get. We've all had teachable moments in our life. Some event happened, sometimes through your children or your grandchildren. Some of your most teachable moments happened. And, and God seems to awaken your, eye, uh, awaken your heart and open your eyes to, to uh, something that he's trying to teach you and to communicate to you. Just a truth that you need to know that needs to impact your life. And I think that's what he's doing with Simon here. Simon's open to whatever it is, at least on the surface he's open. And then he tells this parable, verse 41 and 42. It says, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. And the one owed 500 pence, and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. And then he asked the question to Simon, tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Now, what do you mean by this parable? Well, the creditor was people, someone to whom others owed money. He had loaned out money to, to others. There were two debtors. One debtor owed 50 pence, and the other owed 500 pence. Now, a pence doesn't mean anything to us today, but in Bible days, a pence was a denarius. A denarius was really the equivalent of a working man's wage for the entire day. And so 50 working days versus 500 working days for the average person in that day. To put it in our language, just so you'll know, Let's say you earn $10 an hour today, you work eight hours a day, five days a week, and then a 50 pence center would have owed about $4,000. So it's not a small amount of money, but compared to the 500 pence guy here, the debtor, he would have owed about $40,000. So quite a bit of difference between the 50 pence debtor and the 500 pence debtor in this particular passage. But notice it says, and when they had nothing to pay, in other words, neither debtor had the ability to pay back the creditor what was owed to him. The debt had come due, and neither one of them had the ability to pay what was due. It says that he frankly forgave them both. In other words, he released them from their debts. Now, there are people here who have some debts. Maybe your debt is a car debt. And you've been writing faithfully those checks month after month after month after month, and you're coming to the end of that time, and you can't wait until you write that last check. For others, maybe your debt is a home. And for some 25, 28, maybe 29 years, you have faithfully written a check month after month after month, and the end of that 30-year loan is about to come to an end, and you just cannot wait until you can write that final check, and you're finally released from that debt, and no longer is it, is it, are you, is, it has a hold on you. You feel like you're a, a free person again. You're, you've been released. You've been let go of that debt. That would have been the sense of these people. They would have been released. And, and the Lord says to Simon, tell me therefore which of them will love him most. Simon accurately answers by saying this. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he, that is Jesus, said unto him, thou hast answered rightly. So that's the details of the parable. The third point I want you to see this morning is the application of the parable. What does all this mean? What is Jesus trying to do? You see, I think he's drawing Simon into the application. Here was this Pharisee, maybe out of a curiosity, maybe out of the desire to sort of disprove Jesus, had invited him into his household. He wasn't even courteous to him, but he invited him there. He was examining him somewhat. And as Jesus enters there, he is burdened for Simon, this Pharisee, because he knows that Simon is a man who sees himself as sort of a little better than most people. 
And this dear woman that enters in changes the whole scene and allows the Lord to have an opportunity to to direct some truth to Simon's heart in a way that really has the potential of making an impact upon him that could be an eternal impact. And not only is that application true for Simon this morning, but it's also even true for us, for you. In verse 44, I want you to see this. He turned to the woman. Now remember, the woman is standing behind him. So here's Jesus leaning upon his arm, Simon probably is out before him, sort of at the head of the table, we would say, and he's turning to the woman, looking back at the woman, but he's really talking to Simon. He turns unto the woman, uh, unto the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. He's contrasting how this woman had treated Jesus with how Simon had treated Jesus. And the way that they had treated Jesus had much to do with how not they only view, they viewed Jesus, but had much to do with how they even viewed themselves. He says, I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. So the, the, here he's talking about there's no water from Simon, no, no courteousness from Simon, but here this woman had just poured out her heart on the, up, on, upon the Lord. There she stood at his feet and she had washed his, his feet with tears that had flown down her face and, and dropped upon the feet of the Savior. Verse 45, they, thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. To kiss the feet of someone in this day or in that day was a, was a, was a position of humility and, and homage where you were, you, were, you were really worshiping that individual, acknowledging that individual, and this woman had done so. Verse 46, My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment, not even the courtesy of giving me oil to refresh me, but this woman had brought in this alabaster box a precious ointment had broken the neck of that and had poured it upon the, uh, the feet of Jesus and had anointed him there before all of those, indicating her devotion and her, uh, her appreciation and her gratitude un, uh, unto the Lord Jesus. Verse 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she have loved much. Now I want you to notice the end of verse 47 because I think this is the key in the whole, whole parable in the whole section. It says, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. What's he really talking about in this passage? I think he's talking about a perspective that Simon has, and he's contrasted that perspective with the perspective that this woman had. You see, Simon was a Pharisee, and like the Pharisee in, in Luke chapter 18, he saw himself as a little bit better than most people. In fact, in Luke 18, 11, it says this, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners and unjust adulterers, or even as this publican, as this tax collector, I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. Like the Pharisee in Luke 18, Simon saw himself as a kind of a cut above everybody else. He wasn't that bad of a guy. In contrast, the woman saw herself like the publican in Luke chapter 18, verse 13, which says this, and the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Here, this tax collector wouldn't even look up to heaven. He was too shameful, too embarrassed. He saw himself as exceedingly sinful, and he would not even lift up his eyes into heaven to ask the Lord to forgive him. He was bowing in humility before the Lord and seeking salvation. Really, what he's talking about in this parable has to do with perspective. It has to do with the perspective of how we see ourselves this morning. How do you see yourself this morning? I fear that all of us have a little bit of Simon the Pharisee in us. Oh, we know we're not perfect, perhaps. We might even say that we would be a 50 pence sinner. Sinful, but not that sinful. 
bad, but not really that bad. In contrast, this dear woman saw herself as a 500 pence sinner. She was exceedingly sinful. And when she came to Christ and she found salvation in the Lord, and I think really what's happening in this passage is he's reassuring her, you know, her life had been sinful, he's reassuring her of the fact that her sins had been forgiven. Even the tense of the language indicates that. Notice verse 48, and he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. They have been forgiven. And they that said it be with, with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said unto the woman, thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Here was this dear woman who had entered into this very tense, uh, somewhat uh, a scene where she knew that she would be rejected and scorned and scoffed and ridiculed, but she didn't care because her heart had been touched by the Lord in salvation, and she was so exceedingly grateful for what God had done in her life. She knew she did not deserve his mercy and his grace, but because she had been forgiven of her sins, she didn't care what Simon would say. She didn't care what other ones would do. And she found herself at the feet of Jesus, and the emotion of the moment so captured her heart that she could not help that she just began to profusely cry, and her tears began to flow down her cheeks, and the, and the water began to fall upon the feet of Jesus and she took her hair and wiped him and she took that ointment and anointed him. She just wanted to, to uh, demonstrate her gratitude and her devotion and her love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Could it be this morning that one of the reasons that we do not love the Lord as much as we want even to love the Lord is that we do not see ourselves the way the Lord sees us. You see, what happens in our lives is we tend to look at ourselves as we look at others. We see other people around us and we know that we're not perfect, but you know what, at least I'm not as bad as, and we pick someone, never someone who's better than what we are, always someone who's worse than what we are. And we feel pretty good about ourselves. When the Lord looks at us, he doesn't see us in comparison to each other. He sees us in comparison to himself. And all of us, like Isaiah the prophet that was read this morning, in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, I think the secret to understanding how exceedingly sinful all of us are is seeing the Lord. As we see the Lord, you know what? All of us are 500 pence sinners this morning. It's only by the grace of God and the mercy of God that we have been forgiven of our sin and that we have experienced eternal salvation. I think that's why Paul, the great apostle, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, said it this way. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Notice, of whom I am chief. What was he saying? He was so grateful for what God had done through, through, through Christ for him in providing eternal salvation. He knew that he was not worthy of the salvation that he had, and he saw himself as the chief of sinners. That little phrase at the end of verse 47 is the key. To whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. When we as the people of God begin to understand how exceedingly sinful all of us are. Now maybe you've never committed some of the sins that others have committed. But when contrasted and compared to a thrice holy God, all of us are exceedingly sinful in God's sight. None of us deserve the mercy and grace of God. And all of us, I believe, when we really see the Lord high and lifted up, will fall upon our faces and acknowledge that indeed we are 500 pence sinners who do not deserve God's mercy and his grace. We deserve the wrath of God, but thank the Lord 
that God has provided eternal salvation to any and all that will trust in Christ and in Christ alone for eternal life. And then we can join this dear woman as we stand at the feet of Jesus with hearts that are full of love and devotion, with tears that we could not hold back even if we wanted to, and we would find ourselves worshiping Adore, uh, uh, there at the feet of Jesus, adoring him and, and privileged to stand and be in his presence, which one day, by the way, we will experience if you know the Lord. But it all comes down to this, that if we're really going to love the Lord, in fact, you know, we're commanded to love the Lord. What's the greatest commandment of all? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. I think the reason and the way that we can really love the Lord that way is when we understand how exceedingly sinful we are, how much we do not deserve the love of God, and when we understand how much God loved us, we love him because what? He first loved us. Would you purpose in your heart today with me? As we enter into the year 2016, that, that God would give to all of us here at Bible Baptist hearts that are full of gratitude and devotion and affection and love for our Lord and who he is and what he has done for us, and that we're not worthy of his mercy and his grace. We deserve the judgment of God, but praise God, he's extended to us salvation, full and free through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And although we're not worthy, when we understand how unworthy we are, it causes us to love the Lord even more and to be thankful and to praise him and to rejoice in him. I think one of the greatest truths that we could focus upon as we enter into the new year is, Lord, I love you. Lord, I want to love you with all of my being, with every fiber of, of, of the strength that you give to me. Lord, I, 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 want to, I want to love you completely and totally. I want my life to be all about you. you know, that's what Paul said. A little phrase that sometimes we quote so glibly. For to me to live, you could translate that, for to me life is Christ. His entire life was wrapped up was devoted to, was connected with Christ. His whole life was about the Lord Jesus Christ and his devotion. That's why he was willing to do all the things he did. That was why he was willing to face everything he had to face, suffer the way he did, because it was all about Christ. Would you pray along with me that God would give to us a love and, a, and an affection and a devotion for the Lord Jesus this year that is truly the kind of love that God wants us to have for him? That's the kind of love this woman had. And I believe with all my heart this morning, that's the kind of love that he wants us to have for him as we enter into the new year. A love that is just, you're taken back, you're amazed that God would love you that much and it causes you to want to love him with your whole heart, with your whole being. Because you realize how much he has done for you, how much he has forgiven you, what he has done to provide salvation. And how can you not help but love him that way? Because of his great love for you. Let's pray together. Our Father, we acknowledge that it is so easy for us to live our lives focused upon ourselves. And yet when we look at you and, and understand what you have done for us, our hearts are touched, moved, convicted. I pray, dear God, that you would help us to love you with our entire being, every fiber of our body, every, all the strength that we have within us. May we be a people that are fully devoted, completely and totally given over to you. We thank you, Lord, for providing eternal salvation. 
And I pray that you would help us in demonstration of our appreciation for you to love you with our whole hearts. May that be true of each of us here this day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.